everybody, welcome to Leon's Chainsaw Parts and Repair. Happy Sunday. Man, was this thing more of a challenge than I thought it would be. So, this saw, I'm not sure where it originally came from. I know that my buddy Jim brought it over one day, probably about six months ago. And uh, we were doing some horse trading, and he left this behind and said, Hey, it looks like it's in great shape, starters off of it. Be a good one for your collection. Hey, I don't have one of these little guys in the collection yet, so sounds good. Well, it sat there. I tripped over it for six months or more. Today I decided to fix it. So, what do we have going on here? Well, the starter was off again, so uh, looked in. Recoil spring was gone. Figured, okay, it had broken. Went ahead and upgraded the pulley to the, the nice double uh, wrap that they released later. New starter rope and spring. And, you know, looked over the the rest of it and thought you know I better pull that engine out of the case because I looked in the oil tank and saw some funny stuff so whoever had been working on this saw had definitely done the best that they could with what they had but there were there were some errors so again we'll start with the oil tank this saw is a 1979 uh, looks like around May the hundred and uh, what was it, 14th day of the year, so maybe it was still April, actually that would have still been April. Anyway, still early 79, so it's got a points ignition, but they had already started experimenting with their crankcase pulse uh, oiler. So the old style Super 2s, XL 2s, and the first ones of these XLs had the diaphragm on the side that was actuated by a pulse from the engine which provided pressure through that little short line into the tank, through that duckbill valve that's always supposed to be there, yet never seems to be. And then from there, it pumped oil directly out to the bar pad. This one, or excuse me, on that style, it pumps the oil to a fitting on the engine, and then it goes to the bar pad. This style eliminates that diaphragm entirely, has a pulse port right off of the cylinder on that short line, same duckbill valve, and then the line coming out of the tank is literally a hose that just runs over to the bar pad. So some problems developed immediately with this system, and they, find, they discontinued it after only four or five years, and I'm thankful they did, because it over-oils for one. I mean, that mess, some of it leaked just sitting here, and that was part of the problem it would leak. So you got a pressurized tank with your cap on. As the engine's hot and cooling, there's still a lot of pressure in that tank and it would sit there and push oil out all over the floor. Well, it didn't stop even when it cooled down. So then Homelite recommended that you pull that centered tube uh, that's in the line that the duckbill attaches to. Pull that out. Uh, geez, I don't know. I think this is back to an eighth of an inch. Well, that might work with some of them. It doesn't work with this one. Uh, and a lot of them that I've come across, it, it wasn't a good fix. It wasn't good enough to stop the problem. So the next thing that they did to try and correct the overoiling and uh, all of that was they developed a little restrictor. So on your filter, there's the barb where the hose hooks up. You're supposed to put this little restrictor in there before putting the hose on. This has the most restrictive one that they offered, and it still is making a big old mess like this. So, anyway, a little lesson on the oiler. Uh, they aren't, this isn't the most desirable design ever. But, what I came across was somebody didn't know quite what was going on, and they had installed the centered tube all the way into the hose, and put another piece off of it, with that oil restrictor in this upper hose so it had a constant vacuum leak and it allowed oil to get into the cylinder it took me forever to get this thing cleared out and running right and went fouled out a, a Denso which will put it right where it belongs get the champions folks they're worth it anyway it allowed oil to get into the cylinder through that open port and of course what wasn't in the cylinder had leaked out into the case so I got all that corrected, and on the fuel tank, as is so common, where the duckbill valve should be right up in this corner, there was a damn screw through there. Okay, get that fixed. 
And here's where I made my mistake. After finding all of that, I should have gone ahead, pulled the carburetor off, and really gone through everything. But the diaphragm was pliable, I could tell that. I'm like, nah, it's cool. Get it together. Get it to fire on about the sixth pull, and it just floods out. And I mean floods out bad. So, okay. I worked with it for a little while. I kind of knew what it was going, what was coming, but I was hoping that I was just trying to clear some of that oil and garbage out. But no, it, it was just flooding out too badly. So I pulled it apart, and by then there was gas inside the case. All right. So this thing has the Tillotson HK carburetor on it. They only use that, I believe, on the XLs and the XL2s for as an optional carb for maybe three, four years. And I'm not really too sure why, because it's a pretty good little carb. It is a single adjustment. It doesn't have a high-speed adjustment. That's fixed with the jet. But it just seems to, every one of these that I've run with the HK Tillotson versus the Walbro HDC that only had one uh, adjustment screw, I like the Tillotson better. It just seems to tune a little better. But anyway, get that apart and immediately see that the fuel inlet lever is set way too high, like twice as high as what it should be. And also, the gasket and the diaphragm are reversed. So every one of these two-stroke carburetors I've ever come across, you've got your carburetor surface. I don't even have one out here to demonstrate. That's silly. You've got your carburetor surface. You put your gasket down first, then you put your diaphragm on top, not vice versa. Now this was installed backwards, so once all of that was corrected, then, of course, I had to get the thing cleaned out, and that's how that little Denso got so fouled out. But Put a Champion in there. It smoked up the garage real good. There's still a faint haze in here. Uh, not so faint haze, actually. But you can see it's running pretty good now. This is a survivor saw. Again, it's a 1979 early year. You know, somewhere... I'm going to say April, actually, correct myself. Somewhere mid to late April. All original. This is the original home light chain. It still has an H stamp stamped on every other uh, tie strap. The original sprocket. Uh, the hoses had already been changed out by whoever tried to work on it previously, and they had put a different air filter in there. But that's the other thing. Home light did themselves no favor by saying that the. Let me see if I can find an example here. In the parts manual for these things, you see a, uh, a piece that's called an air filter retainer. Well, I don't know how it is a retainer, because it really isn't. So here's your filter. That's what it looks like for everyone who hasn't worked on one of these. There's the container. That's bolted right to the top of the carb with the carb screws. Here's what the parts list call a retainer. Well, a lot of people will then install it with the filter in the cup, and this thing on top with the filter all smashed down. Well, maybe that's how Homelight intended it. It's not how it's drawn in those parts manuals. And if you look, that ends up pushing the filter down into this choke guard. Every one that I've ever done, install it down like that. And then the filter will sit on top. It can't go anywhere. And that keeps the filter out of the the carburetor throat. So, anyway, I suppose it could work the other way, but again, if you smash it until it's flat, this filter is never going to do what it was intended to do. So, anyhow, like I say, nice clean saw. Jim's right, this one's going to go up in the attic in the collection, and I am glad to have it.